Ah, hello, it's you again. So good to see you. Welcome back to the gallery. I'm sorry, I can't do the entire introduction this time. I still am your humble host, Osgood, but you see, I'm a little embarrassed to admit that we have a bit of a uh, rodent infestation here at the gallery since our old cart passed on. The rats have been bold in her absence. They've gotten into the pantry now, you see. At first, I thought it was the editors coming up for Midnight Dagwood sandwiches, but as it turns out, it is indeed rats. So, I have found an exterminator in the Yellow Pages. Yes, those still exist. This exterminator has extremely reasonable rates to deal with the problem. Almost shockingly reasonable, but they should be along to- Ooh! Yes, that will be the exterminator now. Hello! Oh no. Hey mister, long time no see. Not long enough. Now, state your business, child. PMP Terminators, at your service. P and P. There are two of you now? That's distressful news. If you've got pets and you've got cash, then you've got PMP. I thought you were a scout. Me and my pussycat partner. See? In the cage? Yes, I see. Don't let the name fool you. Pussy's a beast. Together, we are PMP Terminators. Yes, as you said. And it is X Terminators, not Terminators. That's a movie. Nope, we're current. Yeah, I see. Very well. Come in. Let's start in the basement. No, don't open that door. Why not? Isn't that where you have the rats? Worse. That's where I keep the editors. Sorry, I can't do anything about that. Well, you could just get a bigger cat. A uh, Bengal tiger should do it. Be serious. Oh, I am being quite serious. You see, the editors go through a monstrous amount of groceries, and admittedly, my evenings could use a little livening up. Can we get back to the rats? Me and Mr. Pussy have a busy schedule. They are in the pantry. Follow me. It's back here, through the kitchen. Don't touch anything. I like everything exactly how it is. Wow! Even that skull, don't. Look at that oven! I bet you could fit a half an elephant in there. Quite. You cooked a... It's a walk-in model, all right? I acquired it from a delightful woman who lived in the Ukraine. Shall I heat it up for you? Um... Perhaps later, then. Here we are. The pantry. Okay. Let's let my partner out now. Meet Mr. Pussy. Pronouns. Stand back. He's vicious and unpredictable. Don't mind all the scars and missing patches of fur. Oh. That proves he's tough. And he only had one ear when I found him down at the docks. So you know he knows what he's doing when it comes to hunting rats. Of course he does. Good kitty. That's right. Get the rats. And Over there. There's our exhibit kitty. this evening comes from Julia K. Kitty, kitty. Pat. A writer, teacher, and editor living here in Maryland. Her stories have appeared in Clark's World, Escape Pod, and Luna Station Quarterly, among other places. You can follow her on Twitter at Chidorm. Now I should probably spell that one for you. That's C-H-I-D-O-R-M-E. Or simply visit her on the website juliakpat.com. This exhibit will be read for us by Miss Sarah Heiner, hey, a Mr. proud resident of the flyover land of Minnesota, where she resides with more books than she knows what to do with. Mister? Are you sure these are rats? Oh, quite. Only Gutter Girls and Ruined Things by Julia K. Pat. Vida didn't know how the clockwork cat came to be by their front stoop. It was too fine a thing for Mud Hollow, with its glass eyes and its polished brass gears and its perfect rose quartz heart nestled among the gleaming, ticking metal. The artisan had even jointed the tail so that it could thrash like a real cat's tail, and its wire whiskers bristled in the noonday light. Every now and then, it trilled, a high, chiming note she imagined must be a meow. Could be it had fallen from a passing carriage, she supposed, 
if its little master or mistress went careless at the wrong moment. Could be someone had tried to take it from the pretty little shop in River City, and it got loose. Could be a crate had fallen from the cargo train that went through Thursday nights, calling its long, mournful cry to the stars. Always woke her up, that train, and it was a trick not to knock her head on pantry shelves when she did. Getting awful tall, Uncle Bart had said a few days back, and scratched his thick auburn beard in a way that worried her. Best not to bother Uncle Bart, especially when he was home from the mine and tired. Best not be too tall, or eat too much, or breathe too loud if Uncle Bart was tired. Of course, better him than Uncle Nolan. Best if Uncle Nolan never noticed her, or anyone. Uncle Nolan had noticed the clockwork cat, though, and there was nothing to be done about it. The first rock went wide, on account of the fact Nolan was already weaving on his feet, and red-eyed, and belching clouds of burning fumes. Lida knew he could still be dangerous this way, though. He could still snag a wrist or a handful of hair if he wanted. Quick-fingered even when he was stewed was Uncle Nolan. The second stone found its mark, though, digging against one of the cat's perfect swiveling ears and leaving a sizable dent. Another cracked one of its green glass eyes. Lida flinched. She crouched by the side of the house. If she stayed quiet, Uncle Nolan wouldn't notice she was there. But the hail of stones soon bored him. They could only leave scratches and dings and nicks in the polished metal. Out came the pistols, then. The pair of -of mother-of-pearl handled six-shooters Nolan carried at his hips. With these, he never missed. The cat's back right leg buckled when the bullet hit its knee joint. Another shot split that perfect thrashing tail in two. A third crushed its front left shoulder. Even Uncle Nolan couldn't shatter the rose quartz heart, though, not with its protective metal plating. And after a couple tries, he snarled in frustration, advanced on the little automaton, and stomped it into the dust under his boots. All through it, the cat didn't make a noise, and that was worst of all. Lida leaned against the house, trying not to breathe, as Nolan returned to his spot on the porch and splayed loose-limbed back into his rocking chair. She waited an hour for her snores to settle into their steady, even drone. Then she scooped up the remains of the cat and scuttled back into the shadows. The Tinker Witch lived a mile out of town, by a little trickle of creek that was too small to be any use for panning. The water was useful for tinkering, though, because the witch kept a small forage running out behind her shack. It was there Lida found her, when she could finally get away from her chores and minding Uncle Nolan. Neighbor folks said he was making a ruckus in the street. Uncle Bart had chastised her. What was that about now? It was nothing, Lida mumbled. Just an old tomcat. Must have woke him up. Uncle Bart had only grunted. She hid the cat under an old dress and behind the potatoes in the pantry. Although its quartz heart still ticked, the rest of it had been too badly damaged for it to move. The last few nights, she'd fallen asleep to its soft click, click, click. Now she cradled it as she approached the Tinker Witch. A heavy mask hid the woman's face as she hammered at a piece of red-hot metal, shaping it into a plate, like a piece of armor. She heated and reheated it several times, until she had worked it to her satisfaction. And after, she etched intricate symbols on the interior side. Lida stood, watching silently through this process. Only when the Tinker Witch pushed up her mask and demanded, "'Well, what do you want?' did lie to show her the broken remains of the clockwork cat. The woman frowned at the mess. She was younger than Lida had thought, with curly dark hair that sprayed out from either side of her face and freckles across her nose. Her eyes? Green, like the cat's. Ash streaked her arms and clothes. She wore a man's heavy work boots. Don't fix children's toys, especially then they broke on purpose. Ain't you a little old for that thing, anyhow? I didn't break it, Lida said, sharper than she meant. It were my unk, and it weren't right he done it. It was just a pretty cat, not hurting no one. It don't deserve to be broke. I just want to fix it. I just want to fix something, she didn't say. 
The Tinker Witch stripped off her gloves and took a big swig of water from a clay mug. She dragged one sooty forearm across her face, smearing her lips gray. Got money? Lida shook her head. She scoffed. Expect me to work for free, do you? Thought you could maybe teach me how to fix it. Lida towed the earth in front of her, not looking at the witch. I can sweep and cook and wash. And if you need things brought to and from the hollow, could do that too. The Tinker Witch folded her arms, considering. Let me see it then, she said after a while, after Lida was certain she'd say no. She was a good tinkerer, even if she was a witch. Even Uncle Bart said so. When one of the automata broke in the mines, they always asked her to do the work, although only a few of them were brave enough to ask. Uncle Bart was brave enough, certainly. She turned the cat over in her hands, clucking at the bullets and the dents. Messed you up right good, didn't he? She murmured to it. To Lida, she said, Day after tomorrow, when the sky gets red. Bring him up, because I sure ain't got one. Lida almost didn't get clear that first day. Uncle Nolan had lingered at the saloon, and she couldn't leave the house with him still about. Not without earning Uncle Bart's ire, and that she could not afford, cat or no cat. Not when she lived off his charity. He liked to remind her of that, his charity. But it wasn't his fault her daddy'd run off to California, or that her mom had taken factory work up in Chicago. Neither any sort of place for a child, they'd said. And wasn't it kind of her mama's brothers to take her in a while? Mama sent money and letters and city goods every month or so. Daddy had sent nothing since that first postcard from San Francisco. No, she could not anger Uncle Bart. So Uncle Nolan had been an unaccountably welcome sight that afternoon, lurching down the street like a brain-burned prairie wanderer. A jug hung loose from his trigger and middle fingers, and each time he stumbled, a little more sloshed out. By the time he reached the house, it had about all run out, and he peered into the clay abyss, as if pondering its mysteries. It's gone, he concluded, and belched. Come on, Unc. Best you have some of your tea and lie down, Lida said, coaxing him from the porch. If she stayed out of reach, she was usually safe. Sometimes it didn't even occur to him, it seemed, to pinch or slap at her if she wasn't too near him. Don't coddle me, girl. He stumbled toward her, almost tripping on the bottom step. I'm a man grown, I am. Won't tolerate no kind of coddling. No, Unc, Lida agreed. She walked backward into the house, while he followed like an unsteady toddler. Only Uncle Bart says you must have your tea in the afternoons. Put him to sleep when you can, Uncle Bart had told her more than once. Keep him from hurting himself, or anyone else. Nolan batted at the air dismissively and almost lost his balance. Oh, hang what Bart says. But this struck even him as blasphemy, and he looked around as if expecting to see his brother frowning at him, disapproving. When he finally staggered to bed, she flung an afghan over him, set his tea on the nightstand, and left his bucket by his bedside, should he wake up sick. His snores, big and buzzing, followed her out of town. The clockwork cat lay in pieces on the Tinker Witch's workbench. She'd drawn around them in white chalk to show how they had been configured. The broken pieces she laid out separate, and these she was considering when Lida arrived, breathless. First rule, the Tinker Witch said without looking up, never take apart anything you can't put back together. That includes my house, young miss. Understand? Lida nodded. Good. Now today, one clean kitchen for one list of parts we need and how to get them. Sound fair? It did. At least until she saw the Tinker Witch's kitchen and the stack of dirty dishes stewing in black sink water. Cobwebs filled the cupboard, and a thick layer of dust stood upon the floor. Incongruously, a large brown splatter covered most of the ceiling. Ah, that, the Tinker Witch said, leaning in from the doorway, had a disagreement with some stew and the mine foreman. Even her uncles had never left the house in such a state. But the deal was a deal. Lida tied up her hair in a kerchief and got to work. 
She went outside to pump fresh water, went to heat it on the hearth, thought better of it, and cleaned the cold stones of ash instead. Then she set about heating the water. She had only gotten through the dishes when the tinker witch interrupted her, laughing. Okay, okay, that's enough for now. Let's have a look at your cat before the owl starts calling. She showed light of the pile of parts that couldn't be repaired. Several small springs and a few plates and two tiny shattered gears. Easy enough to find or make them, the Tinker Witch explained. The problem is this. Your winding mechanism's about split too. That uncle of yours is a crack shot, he is. He was famous for it once. First-rate gunslinger was our Nolan, before the drink got him, Lida might have said. You should see him when he's sober. Except he never is anymore. Instead, she asked, So what do we do? Well, the Tinker Witch said, can wait and see what turns up in the junk, then repurpose it for our use. That's what we'll do for the springs and the gears. Or we steal it. Those green eyes regarded Lida, steady, checking her reaction. Who from? The Tinker Witch smiled. Lida couldn't sleep. She was curled in her usual space in the pantry, her head on the flour bag and her toes by the potatoes. Her mother's quilt tucked around her like a cocoon. One of the uncles turned over in the other room and sighed. She felt like sighing herself, but didn't dare. She felt quite sure that if she made a noise or looked one of them in the eye, they would know. Uncle Bart, especially. Tomorrow, she was going to steal from the mine. The Tinker Witch had given her a sharp, tapered tool for the job, something of her own invention, just the right size and shape to pry open an automaton's back panel under which she could find the winding mechanism. We won't have the key, the Tinker Witch had explained, but it's easy enough to jury rig them. There are folks back east make a very good living snatching clockwork. Like you? Lida had asked. The Tinker Witch's eyes twinkled. Now what makes you think that? She said, rather than asked. That's what makes you a Tinker Witch, ain't it? How you spell machines and such? She tossed her dark curls and laughed long and loud like a man. Tinker Witch, she repeated. I like the sound of that. Little by little, Lida had cleaned the Tinker Witch's house. She'd scraped the dust from the old carpet, been surprised to find it red underneath. She washed all the linens and scrubbed all the floors. True, the house wasn't especially witchy, although it was quite dark and lonesome-looking, with two windows like bale flies, sealed up with wax paper. The Tinker Witch didn't own much that wasn't for tinkering. A few books, an oily bear skin a map of the Dakota Territories. She had a shiny silver pocket watch that Lida had polished, and a miniature portrait of a young woman with a sad smile. The Tinker Witch hadn't explained, and Lida hadn't asked. The only place she hadn't cleaned was the little shed out back, which she figured was full of tinker work, or stolen goods, or both. Little by little, they had worked on the cat, too, and the Tinker Witch had heated and reshaped the salvageable plates, knocked the dents and dings out with a tiny hammer, and polished away the scratches with a rag. Never get to do such dainty work anymore, she told Lida. I was a clockmaker's apprentice once, you know, back in Baltimore. Before that, I was a gutter girl, dirty as anything and mean as a rat, and skinnier than you. It was the most she'd ever said about herself, and she looked as startled about it as Lida. The Tinker Witch shook her head. Such a quiet one you are. The muckles ever even hear you coming? Lida hadn't answered. But now, they had put the cat most of the way back together, built it around its shining heart, still pulsing and lively. Lida had dug the springs and gears out of the mine's junkyard, but there hadn't been anything like the winding mechanism. Could always wait, the Tinker Witch had said. Could always just wait. Lida told herself in the close quiet of the pantry. An uncle, Nolan most likely, snorted in his sleep. After all, it's just a toy for children. A pretty bit of nothing. No need to risk it. 
Except Uncle Nolan had been getting drunker earlier. He'd come home before noon the other day and started a fight at the saloon two days later. It was getting so bad, Uncle Bart was losing his patience. And when Uncle Bart lost his patience with Nolan, he lost his patience with Lida, too. They were due for a blow-up. She could feel it, the same way she could feel storms creeping across the plains. And if she was honest, she didn't mean to be there when it happened this time. It would be nice to have a friend, even a clockwork one, on the walk back east. Lunch down at the mine had been dead at noon, so Lida came right before the sun stood overhead and waited behind a fallen log. The men were milling about the mine entrance, and among them were the automata, shining brass men who walked with sharp, jerky movements and ticked and clicked as they went about their work. Their eyes were plain amber glass, but they still gleamed pleasantly in the sunlight. They came in all sizes, from as big as Uncle Bart to just two feet high, designed to fit into the smallest spaces to find the next vein. These littlest ones had the mechanism she needed. The others would be too large for the cat. Some of the men were walking back to town to eat at home or have a quick pint at the saloon. She pressed her back against the log as they passed. If any of them looked back, they didn't. Happy enough to leave the mine behind them for the moment. Lida crept closer to the entrance. She could see Uncle Bart, easily identified with his red hair, standing halfway down the tunnel. Several feet away from him, closer to her, she could see one of the little automata, barely the size of a child, trundling towards the miners. It was her chance. Quick as she could, she dashed in and snatched up the machine. Only, it was heavier than she had imagined, and she could only drag it out of the tunnel. She hadn't expected, either, for it to make a noise, but it did. A small, whistling alarm, just as she pulled it out of sight. "'What's that?' Uncle Bart thundered from within the tunnel. She couldn't hear the response, but then he added, "'Sounded like an automaton. The warning noise they make.' Were those footsteps approaching? She didn't have time to get away, so she pinned the twitching machine. It was trying to right itself to the ground and worked the little pointed tool under the back panel. Slowly, oh, too slowly, she unscrewed the edges of the winding mechanism and popped it from its setting. The automaton stopped moving immediately. Did its amber eyes look a little dimmer? Was its expression somehow sadder? Lida swallowed the guilt welling up in her throat. She did not look to see if Uncle Bart was coming. She only ran back up into the trees, slipping on dead leaves, and sure she heard the sound of pursuit behind her. The Tinker Witch turned the mechanism over in her hands and murmured her approval. This is good work, girl. You've barely scratched the edges. That's a light hand you have, even in a hurry. It wasn't a perfect fit. The mechanism casing stood out half an inch from the cat's torso, but it went in well enough and she was careful to show Lida where the winding mechanism connected to the gears, how they caught on one another, and then on more gears, and how the whole thing turned and turned until it wound down. She fashioned a little wire key that Lida slipped on a string around her neck, and the cat sprung up, almost good as new. There was still a little kink in its repaired tail, where it had been a perfect curve, and when it walked... One of the repurposed springs squeaked. Drop of oil will fix that, the Tinker Witch assured her. Together, they watched the cat stretch and pace and twitch its tail, and it regarded the two of them from its crystalline green eyes, although one was now just ordinary bottle glass. That was right before Uncle Bart turned up. Because it was Uncle Bart, and he was unafraid, Two tunnel collapses, and both times he went in again and again until all the bodies were recovered. Because of that, he came alone. When the Tinker Witch saw him crunching down the path, she shoved Lida under the workbench. How did you know? Lida wanted to ask. How did you know that was Uncle Bart? Go on. You can sneak around the house and follow the path down the creek. There's a crossing about half a mile down. Go on and take this thing with you. She gestured at the cat, which Lida took into her arms, cradling it as she scuttled away. 
Uncle Bart was shouting before he even reached the Tinker Witch. You really dare to steal from me and mine, he demanded. Hasn't this town been good to you? Haven't we brought you trade? And here you steal from us, from the very thing that keeps us going. He spat. It was just a little thing, Lida wanted to say, hidden as she was on the other side of the witch's house. They had other automata. They would replace the box, and the little machine would run again in a week or two. The Tinker Witch didn't offer any justifications. You've no proof, Bart. I don't need proof, Bart hissed. So soft Lida could barely hear him. He's furious, she wanted to warn the Tinker Witch. He almost never talks that way. One word from me, and the good people of Mud Hollow would burn this dump to the ground. You won't, though, the Tinker Witch replied. Your mechanic ain't half as good as me. A long, ugly silence from Uncle Bart. Lida almost felt him scowling. Just give it back, he said. Can't give what I don't have. Something, his fist, thudded on the workbench, and there was a tinkle of colliding metal. This is the fourth machine gun tinkered this month. I'm giving you a chance, damn it. How generous, the Tinker Witch replied dryly. Lida was certain she would hear it then, the whack of her uncle's big fist hitting flesh, like the time he had struck Uncle Nolan for spending the grocery money on moonshine. But it was quiet, save for the sluggish gurgle of the creek next to her and the soft whirring of the cat's gears. Then, his boots rustling in the leaves as he stalked back up the path. Lida took the long way home. She hadn't wanted to go home at all, but the little sack of food and her coat and quilt were there, not to mention Mama's letters. They had her address in Chicago, the boarding house that wasn't fit for children. And if Mama won't have me, she decided, I'll just... Be a gutter girl, like the Tinker Witch, until I can find some work. There were tinkerers in Chicago, just as there were from New York to San Francisco. More automata, more tinkerers. And she was good at it. The Tinker Witch had said so. She was loath to sell the cat after it had been such trouble to fix it up, but she could do that too. Find some wealthy, soft-eyed child who'd never been hungry or scared and sell the cat to its parents. She came in the back through the kitchen and closed the clockwork cat in the pantry. It had almost wound down, and she prayed it wouldn't make much noise while she waited for the uncles to fall asleep. In the other room, Uncle Bart was raging. Lousy, good-for-nothing, always pissed drunk. Haven't done a damn day's worth of work in a year now. The hell's the matter with you, Nolan? Uncle Nolan was weeping which was worst of all, because nothing humiliated him like weeping in front of Uncle Bart. He cried on his own sometimes, like a child, and Lida pretended she didn't hear. But Uncle Bart had beaten the man into him when they were younger, on account of Granddaddy being dead so long before they grew up. Uncle Nolan hated crying in front of Uncle Bart. It made him feel small, weak. You don't understand what it's like, he blubbered. We're more than a kid, Bart, and I shot him. Shot him dead in the street. That had been before Lida came, when Nolan was still a hired gun and the most famous shot in the territories. Uncle Bart sighed. It were an accident, Nolan, he said, his voice softer, almost kind. Everyone knows that. Still dead, ain't he? Nolan's voice split down the middle. Bart didn't answer. Instead, he thundered her name, which was the worst sign of all. Lida! Damn it, where is that fool girl? Haven't seen her all day. Lida closed the pantry door and pressed her back against it. Coming, Unc, she said. She clasped her shaking hands behind her. At least he didn't look at her when she came in the room. Uncle Nolan did. And she ignored how red and raw his cheeks were and the slimy snail trail tracks of tears running down both. Clean up this mess, girl, Uncle Bart said, and I'll start our dinner. The room was in disarray, furniture overturned, and liquor spilled across the floor, and Uncle Nolan had missed his bucket when he puked. She struggled not to wrinkle her nose, and started by moving the chairs and the little low table away from the mess. 
She had rinsed away the bile and whiskey puddles on the floor and was getting to scrubbing when she heard Uncle Bart call her again. Soft this time. Too soft. She came into the kitchen and he was standing in front of the open pantry. Not knowing what it was doing, how could it? The clockwork cat was winding around Bart's ankles and the mismatched winding box stood clear out, it seems, from the rest of the lithe body. What's this? Uncle Bart said in that too quiet voice. I found it, Lida said, her voice small, mouse-like. Found it, he repeated. Found it where, girl? What's this here? Uncle Nolan was saying behind them. The three of them crowded into the small kitchen. When's dinner? Then he was looking down at the cat. Huh, looks just like that other one. Bart wheeled on him. What other one? Oh, if he just moved a little to the right, she could snatch up her things. She could go right out the back kitchen door. There was one out in the street, Nolan was saying. And damn, he always had a good memory for a drunk, remembering insults and slights as easy as anything, even after a stupor. And broke it up. Just fun, you know. Just to be cruel, you mean? Lida said, even though she knew it would give her away. Just because you're broke down and small, and you want every lovely thing in the world to be broke down and small, too. They stared at her, the two uncles, her mama's kind brothers. Bart struck her hard across the face. Nolan kicked the cat from where it was winding between his feet and Bart's. It clipped the wood and earthen wall, sending a shower of dust down around it, but it was unbroken. No! Lida shrieked. A horrible smile spread across Nolan's face. His eyes shone. Don't like that, huh? He said. He drew one of his pistols and pointed it at the cat. How about this? Make it so you can't fix it up again, will I? Don't! She begged. Still, he fired. Of course he did. But he missed. The cat was running. But it hadn't run before. Hadn't had a sense of self-preservation. Had only been a fragile toy, easily broken, unresisting. But now it scampered out of the house like a real cat, like a magic thing. Oh, Tinker Witch, Lida thought, half in thanks and half in prayer. Nolan fired again out the kitchen door. The bullet winged into the dark. Stop that, Bart ordered and grabbed for the weapon. Her uncles tussled there in the small kitchen, grunting. They lurched against the pantry door, which splintered, and into the cupboards. And finally, into the little stove with its coal belly. And this they overturned, scattering its glowing contents across the floor. Neither of them noticed this much, because Nolan had his second pistol pointed at Bart's face. Always pushing me around, he said, even when we were kids. The floor was beginning to smoke, and the woven circle rug she'd made for the threshold. Lida scrambled to the pantry and snatched up her little bag of things. Neither of the uncles was looking at her now. Bart had his hands raised in supplication. Easy now, Nolan. Let's not be rash. Making me feel less than small, Nolan hissed. Broken down, like she said. I'm sorry, Bart was saying, and the floor was beginning to crackle. Lida ran out the door, not stopping even at the crack of a gunshot. She walked down the road out of town in the bluing twilight, and after that she followed the moon's yellow smirk creeping above the horizon. The clockwork cat scampered ahead of her. Its eyes glowed green in the dark. Every now and again it mewed into the darkness, a crystal chiming note. Lida shifted her little sack of possessions onto her shoulder. Mama's quilt was folded in her arms. She'd need it, sooner than not. Shadows had swallowed the dim, watery lights of Mud Hollow when she heard the first thud of hooves behind her. Wrong direction for settlers. A peddler, maybe? <sighs> Only if she was lucky. She scuttled off the path, and the cat followed. A lantern bobbed down the road, as if disembodied, held aloft by some spirit heading home from its grim mission. But in reality, it was attached to a cart, and atop the cart sat the Tinker Witch. Come on out now, 
she said to the bushes. Lido obeyed, and doing so, saw that no ordinary beast pulled the Tinker Witch's cart. It was a clockwork pony, thousands of clicking gears turning in perfect sequence as it trotted in place. She had never seen anything like it. Here and there, she recognized pieces from the mine's automata, a gleaming mismatch of metal and parts. How? she could only ask. Maybe I'll show you some day. Tinker Witch smiled. Need a lift? Lida scrambled up next to her on the cart's bench. She spread her mama's quilt across her lap. A clockwork cat, more gracefully, leaped onto the wheel and then settled between them. Its tail curled and uncurled. Its whiskers twitched. Penelope, the Tinker Witch said and held out her hand. Her palm was hard but smooth when they shook. Lida. And the clockwork horse took them down the road into the evening. Lida and the Tinker Witch and the clockwork cat. Ow! He scratched me! Look out! Oh my, how adorable. Is he for sale? And if not, may I at least hold him? Mister, this cat is a stone-cold killer. I wouldn't dare. Not without protection. Oh, pshaw. Here, kitty kitty. Yes, come to Uncle Osgood. That's right. Here, but, up into my arms. Jump, but jump. that's impossible. Do run along, child. You bore me silly. That cat hates everybody. The cat stays here. But... There, there, my sweet. The child is leaving now. Fine. He smells like sewers anyway. Don't listen to the vile creature, my darling. You smell absolutely enchanting. Good riddance to that bad rubbish. Even Mr. Pussy agrees, don't you, Mr. Pussy? Yes. Well... The hour is late, and you should be on your way. I've got to find something to feed Mr. Pussy here. But do come visit us next time at the Gallery of Curiosities. Curiosities is produced under a Creative Commons International 4.0 non-commercial attribution, no derivatives license. All story copyrights remain with the authors. Our theme song is Ashes Ashes by Deus Ex Vapora Machina. Don't forget to spay and neuter your pets and leave stars and reviews for your favorite podcasts, like this one. This episode was produced in August of 2019. For full show notes, visit us on the web at gallerycurious.com. So nice to have a lab cat again. Not to worry about the rats, my prince. Scurrying after such vile creatures is very much beneath your dignity. I'll have Andrew chase him down in the morning. He needs a little exercise. Yes, yes he does. Yes, he does need a little exercise, doesn't he? He's getting a little bit pear-shaped, isn't he? Oh, Andrew. Too many Dagwood sandwiches.